Hello everyone, today we talk about a late antique girl, right, properly the 6th century, a bit about um, Caesarius Bishop of Arles, and a bit what was the pastoral guidance and the uh, education, even of the secular elite, uh, in this frontier area, frankly, in fact, between the, the Merovingians and the Visigoths, right, uh, that would remain uh, centered southern France, which, as we have seen also in other videos, was connected importantly during the early Middle Ages between these various areas of Europe, right? You know, France from one side, uh, Spain from the other, Italy from f from yet the other, and that would mature. In fact, such an important um, synchrosis, let's say, and scientific attitude, if you want, uh, accomplice definitely the permanence of. Uh, certain Roman, uh, you know, a certain Roman dimension in in the cities, especially in the administrations. Of bishops were particularly important in this regard. Think that monasticism in southern Gaul. Look at the you know the the abbots of the La Grande Monastery, for example. Uh, how connected they were, in fact, with the cities of Provence. Still, there was a very a great commixtion between even the hermitism and and the city life. Right, and it's a very interesting corner uh, of Europe at the time because essentially, uh, Southern Gaul was the the culturally most advanced area in the West at that moment, um, especially uh, after the Gothic War. And it would remain, right? Some of the, uh, but not just because of you know, the, because of essentially, in fact, of the permanence of a of a senatorial class that w was essentially the Episcopal one, eventually mixed with the same. Uh, Germanic uh, leadership that uh, maintained for a longer time uh, the, the connection with classical antiquities, right? These were the areas that, as we've seen, had not undergone a dramatic um, destruction, um, devastation during the, the migration era. They had suffered, but not so importantly as other areas. So that structure had remained in what that, that late antique culture, that elitistic. Um, uh, background, right, of the great senatorial families that now were ruling the cities in vests of bishops, right, as the the secular uh, power had evaporated in part, right, together with Roman rule in the West, um, uh, had maintained the the greatest cultural standards, right. Um, you can argue in the whole West, meaning the West extensively meant, meaning that that. Um, well, okay, this is maybe just a digression, but we have explained how instead education worked. It worked well, but on other patterns in in the in the Byzantine Empire. Whereas in, up to the early seventh centuries, in these uh, zootecules that were called of of southern Gaul, you could find those last, you know, big important manuscripts and written tradition, and somebody who still read them, right, and treasured them, even though. Uh, the rapid uh, economic and demographic contraction of the mid sixth century had made things shrinking a lot. Properly, public uh, education was somewhat, you know, compared to Roman times, so had been depleted and uh, shrank, right, and transformed also in character, as we will see. So, the episcopal and parochial institutions in this regard were particularly important because they could. Uh, they they were now called to the task literally of of ruling society, right, and the bishops were particularly interested in such pastoral cares, right. In fact, it was in the canons of the provincial synods that they appeared first of all. These provincial synods were quite important because as the Western uh, Empire had vanished, practically the particular particularism. Uh, in Europe had emerged, right? You you can't see it easily even from the script, polygraphically. I don't know, there was the Merovingian writing, the, the insular writing, the Visigothic writing, and so on, that um, were all expressing a different uh, background, different political ideology, uh, in fact, a different community altogether, and a different church, because the, uh, the, the great ecumenical tradition of, of councils of the church had theoretically stressed, in fact, its own universality, 
in the idea that you know it was a great summoning of all the, the bishops of Christendom, independently from also these uh, political divides, right? They could come from everywhere. Uh, in uh, in uh, at some point, even after the Islamic invasions, there were certain uh, Christian bishops that, that lived in Islamic ruled lands that came to I don't know Constantinople to participate to the theological debates as part of the church was in this sense uh, what what uh, the Roman Empire was was part of but especially in the West where in fact the the, the, the administratively uh, the, the Empire had vanished um, except those areas that were reconquered eventually by Justinian but as we've seen just yesterday just if you know the coast in the coasts Definitely where the important cities were, but not anywhere. For, for example, Southern Gaul, we, we don't know what it was. You know, it was probably not reconquered by the Byzantines. We just don't know. We just know that there were so, so deeply Romanized areas that in spite of the fact they they were in between these important uh, Romano-Germanic powers, the Franks from one side, the Visigoths from the other, also the Burgundians that were, you know, not really a mighty power compared to them, but still they were next door in their Rhone Valley where, you know, Think about Arva itself, um, how connected those and connecting those areas were uh, across Europe. Well, you know, the, the provincial coastal cities kept striking uh, imperial, I mean, Roman currency, what you Constantinople as an emperor and so on, and also the general style of uh, the, the, the if you look at, you know, the, the, the Western coinage and what they looked like. Right. They were purely Roman coins, even re when representing these Germanic kings, and and in a sense, the 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 ecumenicity, uh, the the ecumenicity of, of councils was was uh, paralleled uh, on a smaller scale, uh, the regional, even a provincial one, to define, in fact, matters in the sense of ecclesiastical, you know, mostly a right, or sometimes also theological, because. Uh, there is a, an interesting story behind how the, the things intertwined, right? The, who did, for example, record the canons of the councils, right? If there were this great, you know, Chalcedon, I mean, there, there were various, big, since, since Nicaea, um, did, this councils had been very populated, so literally people came from the periphery, they went there, and there was really not, like, in, in, during the council, certain things were proclaimed, but the way they were eventually copied, uh, and brought back to to the periphery could differ widely, and naturally there was a political gain behind that because by stating something rather than another in the canons, you could implicitly favor a political party or another where you lived, and this naturally contributed also to the detachment from from the center. It was at least a, a mirroring uh, of the same. So the synods were very often, in terms of ecclesiastical policy, actually defining very important secular matters especially in these frontier areas, were so rich but had not quite seen a firm settlement of one power or another. The, the Visigoths were theoretically there initially, but they were defeated by the Franks and they, they you know, concentrated more firmly in Spain. Uh, and and, and for, for that matter, the, this, this southern Gallic area remained always very, very frontier in nature, also profiting in autonomy from it. We made a video on the county of Toulouse. Uh, bit later in time for now, but still you know, the same places technically. Um, so the church's awareness of its cultural responsibilities can be easily, uh, quite easily seen since the beginning of the 6th century, right, in the life of this Provencal bishop. Because a century af after St. Augustine, Caesarius, bishop of Arles, between 503 542, so key uh, key time here, right, the last big late antique stamp, basically, played a decisive role in the adaptation of preaching to the Christian people, right. Um, bishops at this point, as we were saying before, were ruling the cities literally like local, uh, of, like local lords, you could argue, especially in this rich southern Gallic centers. Uh, and uh, for the rest, of course, it was still a you know a, you know a spiritual life, right? The the, the uh, um, Caesarius would uh, lead um, a communal life with his clerics, right? He had them celebrate the three daily office in his presence. He taught them, made them read, 
right hand question on the readings and, and there was of course together the broader church uh, an addressing to the lay listeners of the bishop so mostly countrymen because that's always the majority of the population but of course also many uh, citizens let's say you know, urban inhabitants um, and what is fascinating here is the great work of civilization of the, uh, of the church and uh, acculturation that there were different registers um, for addressing the lay listeners, uh, the, the, um, you know, the, the, the country folk, so that they could, you know, the, this, this, uh, even properly descending by a register to, to the level of their language, right, in order to ensure them a good reception. And this was important in areas where urbanization and therefore episcopal power as a consequence was so was so extended also on the countryside compared to, differently from the north for example where there were many more communities that kind of escaped that strictly u urban circle and this adaptation of register is something that uh, was was necessary for reaching in fact all the strata of the population we've made a video on Santa Quixis for example showing how uh, in the dialogues of, of Gregory the Great uh, there was this enormous work of, of culture for properly uh, accepting that after the devastations of the Gothic War in that sense the, the broader decline this is a bit later from, from now just the, the second half of the 6th century beginning of the 7th how let's say even the greatest senators like Reg Gregory the Great coming from the Anici and so on uh, deemed necessary to, to if you want come closer to the language of the poor people right of the countryside because that's w that was with the decline of the city uh, overall in this game where the majority of moral material forces stemmed from so winning them was literally maintaining a control on, on a great part of the communities properly by political orientation lifestyle etc this is not to be underestimated if we consider how much that Romanity had survived as we were saying before so sometimes overlapping with the Byzantine influence in areas that were not quite the countryside right the countryside had been more Germanized uh, culturally speaking because the peasants were simply more sympathetic to to that system in terms of free freemanship and right you know escaping from the the great nobility of the cities and so on so uh, this could be mean a lot also in the broader political and strategical balance um, Caesarius of Arles would justify the, the use of a down-to-earth language, uh, properly and literally, the Sermo Humilis, as a reflection of Christ's own humility, of course. And, um, and so th there was a pastoral letter also in which Caesarius expressed the need to make, mm, to make properly the, the, this common people reading the scriptures, right? And this was you know, very advanced for, for the time uh, as an idea because it was realizing how important it was to, to make people approach that, uh, that, that culture, that reality in order to be more aware of anything of their own fate and therefore sympathizing more with the urban policy of the bishops and so on. And uh, this idea of, of ideal of clerical life and of clerical training and the practice of a language intelligently appropriate to the new conditions of the exercise of preaching were to exert a lasting influence on the culture of the clergy, right? Because it would um, essentially uh, spread to spread it to a to a, to a smaller scale where uh, in a sense it, 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 it was more private, more, more intimate, more individual, right? The oral teaching dispensed to Christian people by sermons and by the private reading of the Bible was a bit different from the way that the church had usually organized itself right um, initially at least or and or when maybe not initially but when the, I mean the church had been had risen to power after the persecutions and therefore being part of the state so they had to adapt to the new political and social conditions of the sixth uh, the crisis of the mid sixth century uh, so there is um, a big divide, as we were saying, bet famously enough, between the two goals, right? You know, the Gallia Comata, the hairy goal, right, of the north, and the provincia, the Provence, 
um, that intensified definitely during the late empire where the north definitely went more depopulated it witnessed the, the Frankish migration so b probably brought in some models that were different in a sense from the the uh, you know the most Roman culture that you can find in the south but you know still based essentially as we explained many times in the rise of the Merovingian dynasty on this Gallo-Roman aristocracy pre-existing Gallo-Roman aristocracy um, and um, and, and in fact, at, at, at this point, uh, Gaul was divided in two civil dioceses, right? Um, this was true already, uh, I mean, as a broader recognition of this, this split, this difference. This can be already seen from the dialogues of Sulpicius Severus at the beginning of the 5th century, right? Where, you know, that had been properly, literally a shift, right? The, the ancient prefecture of the Gaul wa was, was um, Augusta Severorum. Then that, that was too peripheral to expose to the frontier, so it, it came first to, um, it ended up to Arles, in fact, uh, historically, but, uh, you know, probably understanding that it had to be shifted in a more inner, inter, let's say, uh, you know, internal area of uh, closer to the Mediterranean, f sheltered by uh, the Massif Central, by these maritime connections, right, in a more Roman reality. So that's quite eloquent even for such important symbols of romanization the, the ones that existed on you know uh, on the Rhine such as Cologne to uh, and so on um, so of course the Frankish migration in the north um, increased the cultural differences right so what we see with the Languedoc, Languedoc today is, is, is born out of, of that linguistic already existed because you know that the, the so-called Belgica was uh, was a bit of a different reality compared to the central goal already and also the south since uh, an early age right since the Roman conquest and before um, but these two macro areas now were a bit more the, the norm practically speaking and um, the um, uh, there was a, a you know a, a different rate naturally of integration of these elements but we can't say that in Gaul overall the, the, the assimilation the cross culturalization between the Franks and the Gallo Romans was, was particularly important. Um, the Germans had brought in their own customs right that contemplated an essentially oral physical and military education um, for the sake mostly of, of war right and now they open for the first time to the Roman tradition of a written culture, for example, that was uh, indispensable for the good administration of the kingdoms. So they were obviously Romanized and uh, they began to speak Romance at the same time. In the north of Gaul it took a long time, but let's say that the, the destiny was still f to, to, be, to, to remain a Romance land in this regard. And such uh, new education was uh, naturally connected to the courts, right? Uh, the, the, the Germanic ones. I mean that that surely contributed to spread it, and also to absorb the one of the of the um, you know that they, they received from from the country altogether. So uh, there were some adjustments, such as, for example, the the theoretical knowledge of the seven arts, which was substituted by a more empirical and utilitarian. A technique such as you know surveying architecture medicine law so there was a shift that was more crudely practical in a way but nevertheless still you know, compenetrating these various these various elements um, and one could consider the court as, as a management school in a sense um, that um, it's something that could be applied however already to certain centers in goal before this is something that Richet said uh, back in the day um, when you see that in the third century for example there were the were so called Menian schools of Autun that were restored by the emperors of the tetrarchy with the view to properly create the to, to educate the and train the managers of bureaucracy that during the new the new government new regime uh, as you know, had gone multiplying for a more heavier bureaucracy and greater control in the territory and its resources, more intensive one. 
Um, so this is uh, an important an important aspect. Let's say consider that gold was flourishing. It was in in the sixth century. It was a a very important cultural activity. Let's say at least that uh, must be uh, credited, in fact, to, to such um, to such important uh, you know figures, pastoral ones, uh, but also improperly. Uh, you know the cooperation between the various, um, uh, the various elements of society. In fact, we made a video on Visigothic king and Catholic populations. We were explaining exactly what is what happened at the uh, Council of Autun itself, where also Caesarius was part of. When very important things were debated, but that happened for the first time in Gaul under the patronage of a Germanic king that surprisingly enough given that this was before the Battle of Rouillé and the Visigoths were sealed there was not a Catholic one was still an Aryan one right but it was still recognized by the local bishops as King um, Rex Piissimus literally in, in, in the text um, as um, he had allowed in the first place such ecclesiastical administration uh, to 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 take place and you know had protected the the same council the same the possibility could happen so this in the, also in the importantly uh, as we were saying before varied political necessities that at that point existed in Visigothic in the Visigothic kingdom the struggle always between a pro-Catholic and a pro-Aryan side uh, and that. Um, that were part of the reason, but st still there was a, a need, of course, of integrating um, the, the the Catholic element in areas that were overwhelmingly Catholic. And as you know, in fact, also the I mean the same the same Visigoths would uh, like basically all, all the countries, all, all the Roman and Germanic countries transformed themselves into uh, into Catholic ones at the end of the day because the the position of Arianism per se was untenable. Uh, if anything, for demographic dynamics, but it was never much of a theological problem. It was, it was a political one. It was mostly a struggle between uh, centralization, decentralization. Not always, but still, in the same way. I mean, in the same direction. But uh, as you know, the, the word is important back and forth, for which, however, the general direction was to remain the uh, the the, uh, the the in fact the, the Catholic one that was the most important and the most uh, contemplative unitary in, in a sense. Any, anyhow, uh, this is just a bunch of, of, of considerations and such picture. Uh, late antique Gaul is one of the most important uh, countries and can't be can't be really a history of, of late antiquity without a thorough consideration of what was happening in these areas and especially in the south that connected a bit also these various cultures and helped catalyzing this civilizational processes through which uh, now th these communities were trying to to dislocate themselves because of course they didn't like more than much to be under a king or uh, in the first place but so the bishops played however an important role because sometimes we're literally you know taken away I mean, did they um, there were strained situations where it was open warfare in which they had d to, to defend themselves from the various incursions and of, of these peoples and so on but there was in fact a negotiation between the same because really uh, without without this this spiritual pre and ma also properly material presence as administrators of the bishops that the, the secular powers couldn't quite come to rule in these places and this is quite quite relevant always to understand in broader in a broader mechanism um, all right but for now we stop it here I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time